Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's great to see a lot of uh, familiar faces in the audience. Um, so as John mentioned, uh, I will be covering systemic therapy for advanced melanoma. We're going to divide it into two major uh, topics. We have the adjuvant therapy, basically patients who had surgery, but the cancer continues to be at high risk of coming back after surgery. And uh, a systemic treatment for metastatic melanoma that is beyond surgery, where we need the drugs to fight the cancer. So I'm going to start with, uh, these are my disclosures in terms of research grants and consulting. I'm going to start with the stage four metastatic melanoma. The cancer has spread now into other organs, and we need to do systemic treatment, drugs to treat the cancer. And this we can divide into three main categories. We have the immune therapy that take advantage of the immune system to fight the cancer. We have targeted therapy, drugs that can, are toxic to the, to the melanoma cells, to the cancer cells, and more or less they're kind of targeted and specific for these cells. And we have the old treatment or chemotherapy. We don't use much of chemotherapy these days, but it has a role, it has some activity. We have a drug called Bicarbazine, approved about 40 years ago. But overall, in terms of chemotherapy and chemotherapy combinations, they can shrink the tumor, the activity is limited, and the duration of benefit is also limited. So we usually leave these, let's say, as a backup, maybe salvage option uh, in the treatment of the patients. I'm gonna start, I'm gonna move on to targeted therapy where we have three, uh, four drugs approved by the FDA, vemurafenib, dabrafenib, trematinib, and cobimatinib. And this idea of targeted therapy all was sparked in melanoma by discovery in 2002, where we found a specific defect in melanoma cells that is responsible for the survival of the melanoma cells in about 40 to 50% of patients. We call it the BRAF mutation. A mutation is a defect in a gene resulting in an aberrant protein that makes these cells survive, let's say, uncontrollably. So if you look at this you know, brown circle, think about it as the cancer cell, the tumor cell. And look at these you know, small circles. These are what we call pathways within the cancer cell that stimulate the cancer cell to survive and live longer. So along this pathway that we, look, we call the MAP kinase pathway, there is this protein here called BRAF. There is a mutation in the gene that leads to this protein called the BRAF mutation found in 40 to 50 percent of patients. And uh, scientists were able to design drugs that can block the activity of this protein and now lead to the death of the cancer cell. And the overall outcome was a series of multiple studies that uh, basically moved on in a rapid succession, leading to what we have today, two drugs that are very effective in the management of this disease. Uh, what I mean by that is uh, the drug called vemurafenib and dabrafenib. Overall, the clinical activity of these drugs is very similar. They both can shrink the tumor or cause a response in about 50% of patients. What I mean by this, if you look at this graph here, we call waterfall plot. Uh, zero is the, let's say, the baseline tumor measurements. And if it goes below zero, it means that the cancer has responded. If it, if it responds by about 30% or more, we call it an objective response. So an objective response was seen in about 50% of patients uh, with both drugs. But the second measure of outcome that we looked at is progression-free survival. Progression-free survival is the duration during which the patient lives without progression of the cancer. And the median number, median meaning, 50%, uh, meaning that uh, this is the number where 50% of patients did better and 50% did worse, did worse. So this is kind of in the middle. The median number of, progr of, of progression free survival was about seven months with both studies. The median uh, overall survival living, you know, overall, was about uh, 14 to 18 months with these drugs. And this led to the approval by the FDA, and we started using these drugs in the clinic. In terms of toxicities, we see some uh, joint pains, we see some rash, fatigue. Uh, we see sometimes, and this is not common now, uh, new skin cancers called squamous skin cancer that can be cured with a surgical excision. Other skin lesions, we call them keratoacanthoma, also can be excised with a simple excision. We can see some fever or photosensitivity and some variations between these two drugs, uh, more or less. Now the problem is that you may ask me, why does it work the duration of this response only about seven months. What happens? Well, these cancers develop resistance. We'll go back to the cancer cell, and we'll go back to this pathway and this BRAF protein. 
What happens, and there's a lot of research done here that taught us that the cancer cells, in order to stimulate themselves to grow, they start bypassing this blockade. They start bypassing this BRAF. And many of these mechanisms, they activate a protein, this lower circle called MEC, which is downstream from BRAF. And this gave the rationale, maybe we should block both. Let's block BRAF and MEC. And studies were done in the lab, were done in animal models that supported you know, going ahead with these studies, until we end up with three major you know, uh, multi-center, multinational studies that have taught us the following. So these three studies, which tested the combination of this BRAF inhibitor, dabrafenib, and, uh, or vamurafenib, and the MEC inhibitor, trematinib, or cobimatinib, they are superior to when we treat the cancer with the BRAF inhibitor alone. The response rate, again, the ability to shrink the tumor by at least 30%, now improves from 50% to about 60 to 70%. And the median progression-free survival, living without progression of the cancer, uh, improves to up to about 9 to 11 months. And the overall survival also improves when we do these combinations. And again, these led to the approval, and now we have these drugs in the clinic for the treatment of our patients. So in conclusion, in terms of targeted therapy of melanoma, these are clearly effective. Resistance develops, so a lot of research is ongoing and is needed to try to overcome these resistance mechanisms the way we did that before with the MAC inhibition. And there are new drugs that are being tested. There are new combinations, combining it with different pathways or you know, kind of trying to outsmart the cancer while it, 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 it tends to develop resistance, uh, combining with immune therapy, and what we call intermittent dosing. There is this question whether we should continue treatment you know, every day or should we give, let's say, three weeks on, one week off, etc. These are open research questions and these studies are ongoing. I'm going to move on to immune therapy. I'm going to talk about the following FDA-approved drugs, interleukin-2, epilimumab, pembrolizumab, nivolumab, and TVAC. And uh, so I'm going to divide the world, let's say, of immune therapy of melanoma into in, in this diagram. So if you look at this middle brown circle, think about it as the cancer. This is the tumor cell. And look at these blue circles as the immune system cells. These are the soldiers that go and infiltrate the tumor and fight the cancer. We call them T cells. There are different ways. And the idea is to get these T cells to recognize the tumor and go and infiltrate and fight the tumor. And there are two major ways we can get them to the tumor, what we call passive immune therapy. Basically, you do a biopsy. Your, your body probably has already recognized the tumor, but the T cells are not working well. You kind of uh, select these T cells, grow them in the lab, give them back to the patients. And another way is to stimulate your immune system. We call active immune therapy. Give your immune system drugs to make more T cells that can recognize the cancer and go and fight the cancer. This can be done through drugs called cytokines, like interleukin-2 that I mentioned, or interferon alpha or others, uh, so-called vaccines, cancer vaccines, or so-called immune checkpoint inhibitors or modulators. Uh, these T cells, although they active, they can recognize the tumor, sometimes we can manipulate them with drugs to make them work better or to make them live longer or make more T cells that are similar to them that can fight the cancer. So I'm going to start with interleukin-2. Interleukin-2 is a drug approved in 1998. It's still in use as a most of the time salvage regimen these days. It's given in the hospital IV uh, over about five days. Patient goes home for one to two weeks, comes back, gets another five days of treatment. The overall response rate, again, shrinking the tumor, is about 16%. But about 6% of patients have complete disappearance of the cancer. And what we know from long-term follow-up for years, up to 10 years and more, is that about 5% of these patients, the cancer doesn't come back. So this gave us the first glimpse that maybe with immune therapy, we can actually cure melanoma, and has focused the field also more and more on immune uh, therapy. So I'm going to move on to the more exciting agents, the newer drugs that have made a major revolution in the way we treat melanoma and other cancers, and so-called these checkpoint inhibitors. So what I want to convey from this diagram <clears throat> is uh, look at the brown circle here as the cancer cell. 
and look at the blue gray uh, circle as the T cell. Again, these are the soldiers. These are the ones that go and fight the cancer. So what you need, obviously, <clears throat> is this T cell to actually recognize the tumor <clears throat> and be educated that this is the cancer right there. You need to go and fight the cancer. And for the cancer cell to go and fight the cancer here. And the way these uh, T cells are activated through certain mechanisms, for example, a dendritic cell here uh, that can stimulate the T cell. It's called antigen presenting cell. It educates the T cell and you know, targets it towards the cancer. So you can activate the T cell with a dendritic cell here but even when it's active, you see this you know, plus that it's active, the body has kind of checkpoints or certain breaks. It doesn't want the T cells to be too active because it sometimes can harm the body. So you have <clears throat> certain other mechanisms like this uh, receptor here called CTLA4 that inhibits the T cell. So although this T cell has now been you know, kind of effectively and appropriately re-educated or educated and now can recognize the tumor, it doesn't work well because of this CTLA4 uh, receptor. And this led to the development of a drug called epilimumab that can block this CTLA4 and allow the T cell to do its job and migrate into the tumor, into the cancer microenvironment and fight the cancer. And when it gets there, the cancer has other resistance mechanisms up its sleeve. So now it starts expressing other, like an antigen called PDL1, that can effectively inhibit the T cell by binding to a, uh, another receptor on the T cell called PD1. So although the T cell made it there, it works, but not in every patient. So it works in some patients. In, in, other, in, in, a, in a larger group of patients, there are mechanisms that inhibit the T cell. One of them is called this PD1, PDL1 binding. And this led to the development of drugs like nivolumab or pembrolizumab, now approved by the FDA, so-called anti-PD-1 antibodies to fight the cancer. So we'll start with epilimumab, the anti-CTLA4 antibody here. What we know from the studies that tested epilimumab, and this is an analysis of a large group of patients, almost you know, 1,900 patients, uh, in clinical trials, that uh, when we, the response rate is somewhere between 10 to 15, maybe up to 20%. But what's the more important question to us is, how long do these patients live? And this analysis has shown that if you start here on this curve with all patients, and we lose patients, until about three years, we, get, we reach about 21% of patients still alive at three years. But most important is that the, the survival curve here tends to become more flat starting three years. And there was follow-up in these patients up to about 10 years, uh, meaning that it is possible that we're actually having long-term durable survival in about 20, maybe 21% of patients which is a major advance in the management of this disease. If you remember interleukin-2, we said about 5% of patients have this long-term durable uh, survival. Now, this clinical activity comes at a cost. You're activating the immune system. Sometimes you're not specifically activating the immune system against the cancer, and it may be overactivating the immune system. So it can cause side effects, side effects that can affect our normal tissues. So we see skin toxicity, we see uh, diarrhea and colitis, uh, we see uh, effects on the uh, so-called endocrine glands, the glands that control hormones in our bodies against the liver and other organs. Some of these toxicities can be serious and sometimes can lead to death. So, it is, so this is kind of a new class of, of drugs, new class of cha challenging side effects that we've learned over the years to manage and treat better. But there's still, there are no question risks associated uh, with their uh, use. Now, where do we stand now with epilimumab? Epilimumab has moved now into combinations, uh, trying to improve its activity. I'm going to talk uh, shortly about this combination of epilimumab and nivolumab, so CTLA4 and PD-1. Uh, we led the studies that combined it with interferon alpha, published these data, led to a national study called E3611 that some of you here have participated in it, and where we compared, we combined epilimumab with interferon alpha, uh, combining it with other drugs, basically uh, moving the field forward through combinations. I'm going to move on to the anti-PD-1 antibodies. There is this class of drugs, again, moving to this PD-1, PD-L1 checkpoints within the tumor microenvironment. 
Uh, this is a list of some of the drugs that have been investigated and continue to be investigated. The two drugs that made it to the clinic in melanoma are the ones highlighted in yellow, nivolumab and pembrolizumab. We're going to start with pembrolizumab. This is a, a multinational, multi-center study that compared pembrolizumab here to ipilimumab. The why do we have two different arms of pembrolizumab? Because they looked at a different regimen every two weeks or every three weeks. But basically what we learned from this study is that the anti pd one antibody, pembrolizumab, and similar data with nivolumab uh, are superior to epilimumab. The response rate was about 33%, effectively shrinking the tumor uh, by at least 30%. Uh, and the response rate with epilimumab was, was 12%. And something very important with immune therapy, when we compare it, let's say, to chemotherapy, is that the majority of these responses are what we call durable responses. Patients respond, and they continue to do well. Most of them continue to do well for a long period of time. When we look at the progression-free survival, again, the duration of living uh, without cancer progression, and we look at the median, was also superior for pembrolizumab, as you can see here from these graphs, to the epilimumab. When we look at overall survival, same thing in the graph. We can tell that pembrolizumab in these two red and green uh, curves are better than epilimumab. Now, what about combining these drugs? So if we combine epilimumab uh, with nivolumab or pembrolizumab, let's say, and I, I'm, I'm going to talk about nivolumab alone in a minute when I talk about the combination as well. So basically, we talk that we can effectively activate the T cells, they can recognize the cancer, they can migrate into the cancer microenvironment, but there are resistance mechanisms here. It worked well here, but you know, here is, there is still resistance from PD1, PD1. Should we combine these? And this was done. And there are strong data to, let's say, support this combination. We, because of volunteering from you know, some of you and you know, other patients that may, uh, are not here today, we conducted a study where we gave patients epilimumab uh, before they got surgery. Patients come in with a bulky tumor, and some of you probably know this very well. Uh, we took a biopsy at the beginning. We gave them epilimumab for six weeks and then did the surgery and took the tumor before and after. And we found that epilimumab can, yes, effectively increase the activity of the immune system to send these T cells, and what we call CD8 T cells, cytotoxic T cells, into the tumor microenvironment. And therefore, it makes perfect sense, yes, to add the PD-1 antibody here, make these T cells work better after they go and invade the cancer. And a major multi-center, multinational study was done, uh, summarized here. And this study compared, first of all, nivolumab plus epilimumab, so this combination in orange, to nivolumab alone, this is the drug, which is PD-1 similar to the other drug, pembrolizumab, and compared to epilimumab alone in green. And the results have shown that the, in terms of the progression-free survival, looking at the median, it is 11.5 months for the combination, seven months for nivolumab alone, three months for epilimumab alone. So the combination was better than PD-1 alone, better than epilimumab alone. The response rate was also better. So we look at the response rate with the combination, it's 57.6%. If we look at the response rate with nivolumab alone, it's 43.7, about 44%. If we look at the response rate with epilimumab alone, it's about 19%. So clearly it is superior activity. However, again, this better activity comes at a cost, which is toxicity. So when we see nivolumab plus epilimumab and we look at the treatment-related adverse events, and about 95% of patients got any grade of toxicity, but when the more serious toxicities that may pose a challenge and sometimes may be life-threatening, we're seeing about 55% of patients with a combination. So it is more effective, <clears throat> but it's also more toxic. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and then <coughs> when we compare to nivolumab alone, it is effective. Response rate was about you know, 44%. But the uh, rate of uh, uh, severe adverse events, what we call a grade 3, 4, was about 16%. And it was in between with epilimumab, was about 27%. Now, next I'm going to move on to a new class of drugs called oncolytic viruses. This drug called TVEC that some of you have seen in the clinic. 
uh, is a basically a herpes virus that has been genetically engineered and manipulated to grow only in the cancer cells. So you inject, it's an injection into the tumor. If you look at the you know, uh, uh, upper graphic here, for example, this is the needle, you inject the tumor, uh, this, uh, uh, this manipulated oncolytic virus into the tumor cell, and it invades the tumor cells. It, uh, 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 when it does that, uh, it leads to the destruction of the tumor cells. Now, when the destruction happens, the immune system takes notice and starts sending T cells into this tumor microenvironment. What was done to, the, to this virus is that it was also genetically engineered to express locally a uh, so-called growth factor that can help the immune system cells grow more in the tumor microenvironment. And this you know, helps the combination of this oncolytic activity of the virus, the virus invading the cancer cells, and the immune system working a little bit together, uh, leading to the shrinkage of the tumor. So what was the outcome in large national multicenter studies? The primary endpoint that they looked at in this study, the primary outcome, was what we call durable response rate. Basically, patients respond, but they continue to respond for at least six months. And this was 16% with this drug. Now, when we looked at survival, the median survival, how long people were living, was about 23 uh, months. So it, it clearly has activity in a group of patients. But most of the activity was seen in those patients who have the tumor that is relatively early on. So it is not necessarily in the liver or you know, into areas where we cannot inject. It's mostly lymph nodes on the skin. So kind of, it is, you know, what we call uh, stages, late stage three, and, uh, but early stage four, where we have the tumor, cannot do surgery, but it is not as advanced. It's not, let's say, in the liver. It's not in, in other major organs. So what's the future of therapy? <clears throat> Just in one slide, I believe it's combinations. It is learning how to effectively manipulate the immune system, how to take advantage of all of the tools that we have, all these checkpoints uh, to uh, effectively send these T cells in the tumor microenvironment and effectively activate them within the tumor microenvironment. Combinations of different forms of immunotherapy, possibly combinations with what we call targeted therapy as well. And all of these are studies ongoing in the clinic. And we've started this, actually. So this is a national study led by ECOG Akron, where we're combining three drugs. So you have ipilimumab, nivolumab that we talked about, with a drug called GMCSF, uh, based, uh, compared to ipilimumab and nivolumab alone. Prior data have shown that this drug can possibly uh, make these drugs less toxic, possibly make them work a little bit better. And this is an ongoing national study. What about patients that have a BRAF mutation? And I'm telling you, we have targeted drugs that work, and we have immunotherapy that works. What is better for the patient? This is also another national study, which is ongoing in the clinic, where patients come in, we have a mutation test. If they have the BRAF mutation, they're eligible for these BRAF drugs. They get randomized. Flip a coin, 50-50 chance. Either get the targeted therapy, or get the immune therapy, nivolumab plus ipilimumab. As long as they're doing well, they continue. If they progress, they cross over. They go to the other treatment, and they continue. And finally, in conclusion, uh, basically, I think these recent advances in immunotherapy of melanoma has moved the clinical management of this disease into a new era, an era of long-term survival and the potential of achieving cures. I think we are very optimistic about this potential of achieving cures in the near future in melanoma and hopefully in more and more of our patients. I'm not gonna, uh, I can go over the others uh, in terms of the activity of IL-2. We know that IL-2 has some activity, uh, but uh, you know, it is used as an other active regimen if needed. Epilimumab has led to long-term survival. Uh, the PD-1 antibodies, nivolumab and rolizumab, are better than epilimumab, and combinations work even better, but they're more toxic. And the future is in other combinations, and this is an ongoing field. So in terms of adjuvant therapy of melanoma, so now we have the cancer. Patients had surgery, but they belong to this group of patients that called uh, high risk of the cancer coming back. So so-called stage 2B or 2C, the cancer is deep in the skin, maybe ulcerated, or patients where the cancer has gone to the lymph nodes, and in both cases, it is poised to spread further, or maybe it has already spread, 
but it's only what we call micrometastases, hiding, that will be expressed in the future. And therefore, these patients require or need treatment to minimize the risk that this cancer will come back. So what we have approved by the FDA, three drugs. Uh, this is a little bit complex table, but basically what, the message from this table, so we have three studies that test a drug called interferon alpha, high dose interferon given over one year. And uh, uh, one drug that tested what we call pegylated interferon alpha, given over five years. If you look at the yellow uh, here in the last two columns, this is what we call hazard ratios. If it's one, it doesn't work. And if it's less than one, it works. And the more it's less than one, then it's more it's activity. Uh, uh, so basically, all of these drugs have shown the ability to reduce the uh, risk of the cancer coming back. Only the one-year regimen, the high-dose one-year regimen, has reduced the risk uh, of death in two out of three studies tested. And recently, epilimumab uh, was also approved by the FDA actually last year at the dose of 10 milligram per kilogram. Um, uh, the primary outcome in this study was what we call recurrence-free survival, reducing the risk of the cancer coming back. And we look again at this hazard ratio. It's less than one. It's 0.75, 25% reduction in the risk. Maybe similar to interferon, uh, uh, but we don't know. So basically, uh, this drug was approved. We don't have the overall survival data from this study. This is expected to be reported in the coming uh, few months. And again, this, uh, this activity here comes at a cost, which is toxicity. This drug is given at a dose of 10 milligram per kilogram, when the dose approved in metastatic disease is actually 3 milligram per kilogram. It's less toxic. Here it's more toxic. About 40% of patients may have severe toxicity that may be challenging and is life-threatening. And in fact, about five patients on this study, 1.1%, died because of drug-related adverse events. So we have to be very careful you know, what patients are going to use this drug and how well we're going to uh, uh, manage the toxicities. And <clears throat> what's the future of melanoma adjuvant therapy? We completed the study called E1609. This is a national study where we tested epilimab at 10 milligram per kilogram, but also tested at the lower dose, the less toxic dose, 3 milligram per kilogram, and compared it to interferon. We enrolled about 1,600 patients nationally, completed that role in August of 2014. We're expecting results, hopefully, about a year from now. Uh, uh, studies have been done with targeted therapy in these patients. So patients that have the BRAF mutation, and uh, we don't have the results of these studies, probably expected maybe next year as well. We recently initiated a study called S1404, also it's a multi-center <coughs> cooperative group study, where we're comparing anti-PD-1 pembrolizumab uh, versus the standard, which is interferon or epilimumab. So this is a study ongoing in the clinic. Some of you may be on this study. And nivolumab also has been tested, a, st a study that tested nivolumab versus epilimumab completed its accrual last year, <clears throat> and you know, we expect results you know, in the next uh, few years. Now, <clears throat> briefly, just two slides about biomarkers, making these treatments more personalized or individualized to the patient. Do we have a test that we can do on the blood or in the tumor uh, that can uh, tell us this is the best drug for this patient, or this is you know this drug is maybe too toxic for this patient? So this is all uh, these uh, this is all work ongoing in the lab and going in the clinic because of volunteering from patients like you are giving us blood, 14 tubes of blood, and giving us their tumor, and we're doing all these studies. Uh, and, and briefly, we uh, reported data on a gene signature. You take the tumor. You test the genes in the tumor and see what genes are turned on, what genes are turned off. And if you look at this you know, colorful map, we call it a heat map, uh, the, uh, the, what we call x-axis here are the patients, and this y-axis here is the genes that are either turned on or off. Green is turned off, red is turned on, black is in the middle. Based on this study, we're able to, to classify our patients based on the, whether these 27 genes are turned on and off, and to those that have very high risk of the cancer coming back, see this red curve here, or very low risk of the cancer coming back, the black curve here. And, and this is part of a set of other studies that we're doing, and you know, obviously this is preliminary data that requires validation, and this is work that is ongoing. And the risk of toxicity, epilimumab, some of you got it and got diarrhea, got colitis. Some of you end up in the hospital on high-dose steroids. 
can we do a test in the blood that can tell me this patient has you know, a higher risk of getting colitis or that toxicity, et cetera? And there's a lot of extensive efforts, again, because of volunteering from you. And we reported last year this data from a uh, test, uh, you know, a cytokine, we call it, called IL-17, uh, that is associated with the risk. Now, this is all preliminary data, but this is the kind of work that's going on you know, our place, other places, and being validated on a national level in larger studies. And the hope is that, yes, ultimately, we'll individualize treatment, make it personal for you uh, in terms of the activity and the risk of toxicity. And finally, I'd like to thank you, all of you, uh, for uh, being here today. Thank our patients uh, who, who's volunteering and uh, made all this research uh, happen here and everywhere. Thank you.